Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Barnard and PCRM, obviously, for inviting us, as well as the American Heart Association. I know I see Kevin. I thought Christy was here just a second ago um, for, for joining us this afternoon as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, school lunch in the broader context. And I think this comes from uh, not just my work with the American Heart Association, but in obesity in general. Why are we tackling school lunch? I mean, there are so many other targets for improving obesity. So let me present a rationale to you. Um, first of all, I, I should confess, uh, I, uh, I did not grow up having school lunch. I grew up in Canada and would walk home at lunchtime and have dinner, lunch with my mom and my younger sister and walk back to school and then play after school. So how many of you uh, experienced that when you were children? Very few these days, right? Mm -hmm. Scott did. Okay. So, uh, so uh, that, that's unusual these days. And I'm also not, I was not a really big fan of school lunch when I moved to the U.S. about 20 years ago. Um, and I started my obesity work, I was concerned that school lunch actually promoted obesity, especially among low-income and minority children, Partly because, mostly because the school lunch was so unhealthy and children had so many unhealthy choices in that environment. But I'm pleased to say that I've, I've come around as, as changes have taken place. So here's a couple of guiding principles. How many of you have heard of the built environment? Good. So ultimately, the built environment, uh, according to most experts, is the solution to our public health problem of obesity. So as someone who ran an obesity center for, for many years, I can tell you that no matter how many children I saw, how many of them did well and succeeded, there were always thousands more out there that would not, uh, would not come in or would not be responsive to the interventions that we had. And only changing our environment will, will, uh, will promote lower rates of obesity. The built environment encompasses everything that's man-made, it encompasses our schools, our workplaces, our community food environment. As a physician, it encompasses our physicians' offices as well, because we are in neighborhoods, we're in communities, we're in hospitals, uh, we employ people, we provide food. So everything that's around you, and that's, that has to change in order for us to solve this problem. Second guiding principle, I think Dr. Barnard mentioned this when he started off, and this is quite shocking to a lot of people, that heart disease actually starts in childhood. So much of my research deals with dealing with cardiovascular risks in children, which you don't usually think of. Uh, and it used, to, you know, it used to be that when you turned 30 or so, you'd start to undergo some screening of cholesterol, your blood pressure was monitored more carefully. That, of course, has changed dramatically. Uh, and it actually comes from some gruesome details, which I won't get into, but sometimes young children do die in accidents. And through autopsies, it is revealed that they have the beginnings of heart disease at that age. So if we're really going to prevent this problem and the consequences of obesity, we have to start with our very young children. So that, those two uh, guiding principles at the outset, I think, are very important to understand. Here's something else. So why are we targeting school lunch? Well, first of all, the public wants healthy food for their children, uh, despite what you might hear from some people within this building, and I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nobody here, I'm hoping, maybe. But parents uh, want healthy food for their children. And actually, why do they want it? Healthy heart is the number one reason in 24 countries, this is US, Canada, and, and Europe most, uh, for the most part, reduce risk of disease later in life. So parents are thinking, as we do, about the value of healthy food. Um, so let's keep that in mind. So here are some key questions that I use to structure my presentation. And I want to thank Scott and, and um, um, Dr. Briefel for put, you know, putting in some great information, and, and Dr. Giles, of course, gave us some background on obesity, so we'll go into that again. But the question is, can the updated nutrition standards be successfully implemented? And the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, according to, to the USDA, 90% of schools have implemented the standards, um, and we started off at about 14% um, when, when the st new standards were introduced. So yes, they can be implemented. Uh, do the new standards have an impact on consumption of healthy food? Now, Scott has already gone into much more detail, but a couple of things, just to summarize, I think, um, in, uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health, is that vegetable consumption increased quite significantly, and fruit selection, if not consumption, also increased significantly. And that's, that's still pretty early on. So the answer to that question is yes. Can changing the school food environment impact overall nutrition? And you see this statistic quite often. Up to 50% of the food consumed in school, um, up to 50% uh, of food consumed in a day is consumed in school, especially by low income and minority children who uh, also suffer disproportionately from obesity. And those are, those are most of my patients. So if half of the food you eat is actually in school, of course your overall nutrition is going to improve. 
Um, there are other things I'll talk about at the end in the, in the way in which the school food environment can assist us in overall nutrition. So the answer to that is absolutely yes. Here's some big questions that come up from the scientific community, from policy advocates, from people who provide funding for, for research in this area. Does creating a healthy school food environment have an impact upon obesity? So you can say, well, we created this healthy school food environment. That's wonderful. It's terrific. But are we going to, is this going to help solve this very serious public health problem that we have? Well, there's two sources that I always refer to. One is called the Cochrane Collaboration. And it's the Cochrane Collaboration of Systematic Reviews. Um, I have, you know, some of their work is controversial, I will confess, and I disagree with some of their methods. That having been said, their work in childhood obesity is very, very rigorous. I see John, Dr. Josh smiling as well. Uh, very rigorous in terms of the systematic reviews and meta-analysis they put together. So they, they looked at what could actually help solve this problem. Uh, one of the things they list quite, uh, quite prominently based on reviews of, of the literature all over the world, studies, unpublished, published, uh, all kinds of, of, of um, papers that they looked at was that modifying the school and food environment does lead to lower rates of obesity overall. No question about it. But closer to home, we have the uh, Healthy Schools Program, which was a uh, jointly sponsored by the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, the Clinton Foundation, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And this involved uh, substantial changes to the school environment, not just in terms of nutrition, but in terms of physical activity and education as well. So nutrition was a very big component. What were the results? Well, my, th the subject that's near and dear to my heart is sugar-sweetened beverages. Consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages decreased dramatically. Physical activity increased. Healthy food choices increased in, in the schools that, that follow this. And interestingly enough, rates of obesity increased as well. So, and that's what we're looking for. So the question, the answer to question number four is yes, and no question about it. So does it really make a difference in the long term? So okay, let's say we change our school food environment and we see some positive changes in consumption, we see some lower rates of obesity. Uh, does that actually lead to decreased cardiovascular disease in the long term? This is not a question we can answer today in 2014. It may be some time before we're able to answer it. Uh, we know, uh, if you follow my rationale, that healthy eating leads to lower rates of obesity. And I think few of us would dispute that. We also know that in children, if they have lower rates of obesity, they have lower rates of cardiovascular risks. And cardiovascular risks refer to high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, risk of, of type 2 diabetes, uh, and, and related, uh, related things that are a bit technical. But those tend to go down as you get lower rates of obesity. But you also get slower progression of atherosclerosis or clogging of the arteries. So can we prove today that if we change our school food environment, somebody's not going to have a heart attack when they're 50 or 60? No, we can't do that. Um, nobody's going to be able to do that. And that's one of those unreasonable standards that we in the obesity community are often held to. Uh, and it reminds me very much, and I don't want to get sidetracked too much, of, of the uh, arguments made by the tobacco industry 20 years ago. Can you prove that, that uh, smoking causes uh, death, uh, you know, without a shadow of a doubt? And the answer is probably not, but we're pretty sure um, that it's going to work out. <laughs> so why school lunch? Ultimately, my final argument is this. Uh, I, talk, I started off by talking about the built environment. Um, we can't leave schools behind. Okay, so there are a number of other organizations I'm involved with and I've spoken to different groups about healthy workplaces. So these are the parents of our kids, right? Um, and uh, um, college campuses uh, have now have huge initiatives to promote healthy eating on campus as well. So we've got workplaces, we've got, uh, we've got college campuses, hospitals. Believe it or not, there used to be uh, quite a few McDonald's. Mm -hmm. There still are in, in hospital environments. Um, and, and fortunately, there are, there's a movement to change that and to provide healthier food uh, on, in hospital environments. So we've got that as well. Government built buildings have changed. I mean, you'll see that sugar sweetened beverages have been, uh, I don't know if they're still available in this building, but in many government buildings they have been removed. So we're, we're creating a healthier environment, a food environment, in all of our, all the places where we live and work and play. Why on earth would we leave our children behind, our most vulnerable? Uh, citizens of all, our entire future. That wouldn't make any sense whatsoever. It's completely irrational. And that's why I'm here. So thanks very much.